Today, we're going to take a look at what it takes for a couple to retire in Canada with $7,500 a month after tax in their jeans, money to spend. Now, before we get into it, I just want to say that we do a lot of retirement plans for people. A lot. And I get it. This could be an obscenely small number to some of you. And for others, $7,500 a month could be absurdly large. But I can tell you that this is actually a fairly normal starting point for a lot of Canadians. So don't hate me if these numbers don't apply to you. I had to pick some number to get going on this video with. Now, as is the case, with real life, there are all sorts of different possible scenarios that can play out. So in this video, we're going to look at four different scenarios to try to make this video as applicable to as many people as possible. The first one is RRSP heavy, where most of the resources are coming from RRSPs. The second one is a mishmash. And yes, that's a real word. And in this scenario, the resources are coming from a bunch of different types of investment accounts, not just RRSPs. Then we're going to look at a mishmash with a pension. This one is somewhat like the last one, but also includes a mid-sized defined benefit pension, providing some very delicious gravy all the way throughout. Lastly, we're going to look at a downsized scenario. In this scenario, there are some investments available, but the plan requires the sale or downsizing of the home to make it happen. Now let's get our assumptions out of the way. And to keep things simple, we're going to use the same ones in all four scenarios. Life expectancy. We're going to plan to age 90. They may not live that long, but then again, they might live longer. And with all of these things, we have to pick something. So inflation. This we're going to peg at 3% over the long run. Because again, we have to pick something. And it has to be reasonable over a long period of time. All the investments will be held in a balanced portfolio earning 5.19% a year in perpetuity. Now that's not because I recommend a balanced portfolio, in fact I almost never do, but just because it is simply the most common portfolio out there. It is the pablum of our industry. Everyone in our story is 64 years old, and everyone is retiring at the beginning of next year when they turn 65 and they all live in British Columbia. And they've all managed to get rid of all of their debt before they retire. Good for them. As for CPP, we're going to have each person tracking to get 80% of the maximum amount possible at age 65. We're doing that because a lot of people have not maxed out their contributions to CPP all the way through their working life. And so most people are not actually going to receive the maximum possible benefit when they retire. For OAS, we're going to assume that everyone has been in Canada for 40 years after age 18, and so will be entitled to the full benefit when they hit age 65. And just so this video doesn't take all day, I'm actually going to strip out having an emergency fund or a war chest, as I like to call it, from this plan. Now, I definitely recommend that everybody have a war chest. You, you need to have one of those going into retirement, but I'm not going to include it in the plan just to keep things simple. Also, in each scenario, there is a family home that is paid for and it's worth $1.3 million. But we're going to leave it out of the plan in all of the scenarios except for the last one, the downsizing scenario. And that way, someone who does not own a home can still see how these different scenarios would apply to them without having to rely on that asset. Last but definitely not least, we're going to build in a go-go phase, a slow-go phase, and a no-go phase. Now, I know this video is about having $7,500 a month in retirement, but most people do not spend the same amount all the way through. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give them their desired income for their go-go phase, which we're going to peg at age 65 to 75, and then drop it down a bit as they age, because in reality, that's what happens with most people. They tend to spend less as they age. So in the slow-go phase from age 75 to 85, we're going to drop it down to $6,500 a month. And in the no-go phase for the last five years of their life, we'll drop it down to $5,500 a month. Okay, now that we've got the pleasantries out of the way, let's dive in. Scenario number one, RRSP heavy. Meet Van and Ann Mann, lovely folk. 
They have worked hard for a really long time and stacked up a pretty decent size investment portfolio. Now, because they were both working and had fairly high incomes throughout their years, they chose to focus most of their savings in RRSP so that they could reduce their taxes, which was actually a pretty good idea for them. But in the later years, they decided to put some of their focus into TFSAs as well so that they could develop some tax-free savings that would be available to them throughout their retirement. Good call. So now, Van has 450 in his RRSP and Anne has 360 in hers. Plus, she has 120K in her TFSA. So basically, we're looking at a total portfolio of 930 grand, just shy of a million. Now, if we hop into our beautiful software here, we can see a few things right off of the bat. If you look here, you can see that each one of these columns is a year of their life. And the columns are getting taller each year because we have 3% inflation built in. Each year, they will need a bit more to keep up with the rising costs. And these different colors in each column show us where the money is coming from to meet their income goal each year. So for instance, in 2024, you can see there's just one color here. Their money is coming all from one source. And because they're still working, that's their employment income. In 2025, when they retire at age 65, we can see that it's coming from four different places. It's coming from CPP, OAS, their RIF minimums, which is simply what their RRSP accounts converted to after they retired. And then the rest is coming from their TFSA. And then way over here, you'll notice some red. That's their shortfall. At this point, they have run out of the money in their investment accounts and are left with their CPP and OAS only. Now, without any planning, we can see that they are close to hitting their goal. They're 96% on track. They have almost enough money to do what they're trying to do. However, with just a few tweaks, we can get them there. If we choose to delay their CPP and OAS payments from age 65 to age 70, then they will get a higher payout from each each month. They would get a 42% increase in their CPP benefit and a 36% increase in their OAS benefit if they choose to delay taking them to age 70. Obviously, that's a pretty big increase. Now, if you aren't familiar with how these plans work and the pros and cons of delaying or taking earlier, then I highly recommend you check out my detailed video on exactly that. I'll drop a link below. But for now, we can see that this is actually a pretty good idea for their situation. It isn't always, but in their case, it helps. Now, I just want to point out that we're actually going to do this in all four scenarios. We're going to bump out CPP and OAS to age 70, just to keep things fairly similar, except for the key variables. However, in real life, most people do not end up delaying CPP and OAS. Maybe they delay one, uh, but usually not both. However, in some cases, it makes a ton of sense and therefore they should do it. But again, doesn't always make sense in all cases, but that's what we're doing today. Anyway, back to the man fam. If we choose to delay both of their CPP and OAS pensions, then they will have to spend more of their own resources earlier. But then they'll have to spend quite a bit less of them later. And as you can see, this takes them from 96% on track to 100% on track of their retirement income goal. Done. Solved. And if we just tweak their withdrawal plan a bit to make sure that they're pulling the right amounts from the right accounts each year in order to minimize their taxes, then we can see that that actually give them an extra bump. Now they're at 101% of their goal. Now this doesn't leave them with much room for error, but there's also quite a bit more finessing that we could do here if we wanted to. For instance, we could convince Van to do a bit of part-time work for another five years, earning a cool 20 grand a year, just to be safe. And look at that. Now they're up to 108%. Delicious. And there's way more that we could do, but that's enough for this scenario. Scenario number two, the mishmash. Meet Stevie and Dee Dee McGreevy. Now these cats have worked all over and have quite a few different kinds of accounts. And they actually just received an inheritance not too long ago, which they used to max out their tax-free savings accounts and put the rest into a joint non-registered account. Now I set this up so that they would have the exact same amount of money in their investment portfolio as Van and Ann Man, 930K. 
but theirs is made up of a whole bunch of different kinds of accounts as opposed to primarily in RRSPs. And I did this because I wanted to demonstrate the difference that it can make when you have different kinds of accounts that are taxed differently. Same amount of money, but different outcomes. So here's their breakdown. Stevie has 350K in an RRSP and 100K in a TFSA. Didi has 100K RRSP, 160K Lira, which is a locked in retirement account from an old pension plan, and 120K in a TFSA. And they also have a jointly owned non registered account sitting at 100K. But again, same total as the man fam, 930K. And if we hop back into the software, we can see that their starting point is 100% on track versus where the man fam started at 96% on track, but with the exact same amount of money. And again, this is simply due to the fact that the McGreevies have more of their money in accounts that are taxed more favorably. And if we just do the exact same things that we did for the men's, delay CPP and OAS to age 70, and then optimize our account withdrawal strategy so that we're pulling the right amount from each account each year so that we can reduce the taxes payable, we can see that they're at 105% without even having to send anyone back to work. Not bad. Again, there are way more things that we could look at to make their situation even better, but for the sake of time, let's move on. Scenario number three. Mishmash with a pension. Meet Ray and Kay May. Kay works for the government, and while that makes her want to smash her head against a wall some days, she certainly digs her pension. In fact, when she retires next year, she is entitled to a pension of $2,000 a month for the rest of her life, and it is indexed to grow with the cost of living. Lovely. Now, because of this pension, which she has been contributing to over the years, she does not have an RRSP but she does have a TFSA with 100 grand in it. And in addition to that, Ray has an RRSP with 250 grand in it, a TFSA with 100K, and they also have a joint non-registered account with 30 grand in it. So in total, they have a $480,000 portfolio, which is pretty much half of what the last two couples had. But as you can see, they don't really need much more because they're pretty stinking close to ending up in the exact same spot. They're 97% on track, all because of Kay's beautiful inflation-protected pension. And of course, like the other couples, they also have CPP and OAS. Again, if we just do a little tweaking and push out their CPP and OAS payments to age 70 and optimize their withdrawal plan, we can bump them up to 102%. Normally, I'd like to see a bit more of a buffer than that, but you get the idea. Now, one of the really nice things about a situation like this is that if you look at their income over the last 20 years of their retirement, you can see that between Kay's pension, their CPP, and their OAS, nearly all of their income is made up of guaranteed inflation-protected sources. Very appealing. Scenario four, downsizing. In this scenario, we have Bill and Jill Gill. Now, they don't have as much saved up, but it's always been their plan at retirement to move out of the city and downsize, or at least down price. So as it stands, Bill has 200K in his RSP and Jill has 100K in hers, as well as 50K in a TFSA. So between them, they have a $350,000 investment portfolio. Their home is worth $1.3 million right now, and they want to see what they can get away with purchasing when they move and still get them that $7,500 a month in go-go retirement income. So let's take a look. Well, as expected, it looks pretty bleak at first, but let's try out some numbers. The first option is buying a new place that costs nine hundred dollars which, of course, if they sold their $1.3 million home, would leave them with an extra 400 grand to add to their investment portfolio. Well, that only gets them to 87% on track. Of course, if they wanted to, they could sell this place as well in their 80s and simply rent for the last stretch of their life and use all of that money to fund the last years of their life, which would give them more than ample. But ideally, they'd like to leave their house to their kids if possible. So it's back to the drawing board. Now, what about a new home that costs 800K? Well, that could work. If we delay CPP and OAS and tweak their withdrawal plan, 
we can get them just over the finish line. No buffer though. So what if we looked at a new place that costs 750K? Hmm, not bad. But if they can find something good for 700K, it looks a whole lot better. So there you have it, four different ways to get you to $7,500 a month in after-tax income for your go-go phase of retirement starting at age 65. Now, obviously, there are other ways that you can get there, and there are a whole bunch of strategies that we didn't even touch on that can help improve the situations that we were looking at. But at minimum, this should give you a very solid idea of what it takes to get there.